John, what is our relationship <coughs> to you and your relationship to us? You are what I am, and I am what you are. There's no relationship. When you look from the mind, there's relationship. In this non-relation, there's no qualifi qualification. So I say not qualify you, you are free. In my non-relation, I free you. I make you free. related to what was said about looking without the mind being in a way. And this brings me back to the question I had earlier about um, what is the method you approach, the technique, the methodology, by looking without having the mind in the way? And I know it's just a method, and ultimately that has to disappear too. But what, what do I need to get started on that path? Be attentive. See that you don't pay really attention. Your attention are not innocent. <clears throat> attention means completely being open. When you are completely open, you are not more in psychological memory. Psychological memory keeps you in restriction because it is only for the survival of the person. Free from psychological memory, you are open not only to the unknown, but you are open to the unknown and the known. In attention, you will grow into awareness.
understand the words, but how do I become more attentive? See that you are not attentive. See it. That's enough. This attention is silence. All creativity comes out of silence. <coughs> when you start by the known, you can never be creative. Creativity comes out from the unknown, from silence. Postpone all judgments, postpone all conclusions. Wait. In being, it appears things give themselves up. One changes one's job to come more in harmony. One changes one's food. A little while ago you said that in being there is no relationship. I am you and I am what you are and you are what I am. What about relationship in terms of marriage? When one comes into the state of being, can you speak to, to marriage and what that holds for a person? Marriage, in a certain way, doesn't mean anything for me. You married from moment to moment. Marriage is a social commitment. It doesn't mean for me anything. What is it then? Is there a glue, so to speak, that binds two people together? It makes it sticky. <laughs> <laughs> Then there is love, there is not a you, there is not another. There is oneness. It is only in this oneness that there is growing pos possible. There is constant stimulation. In this love, you are free, and to you make your surroundings free. There's a right distribution of the energy. And looking, hearing, touching, being together.
as immediately harmonizing of energy. <coughs> Sometimes you, you uh, share this, uh, you undertain this oneness on a physical plane. But there is constant uh, marriage. I realize that my question really comes out of, out of my fear that to come totally into my being, that marriage, as you said, would end. It would have no meaning. So therefore, why would there be any, be any reason to when there's fear, look at your fear. When you look at really your fear, it will be transformed in, in love. But you must go through the fear. You must go through. You must not uh, refuse it or escape it. Every moment is new. You create, you are, like, you are the creator of, of every moment. Especially with, when you live, live with your surroundings. Don't make any object with your surroundings. And your love there's constant new looking. There's no repetition. Living together is a, a high art. To be really totally what you believe and what you are, the only way. And not react. And certainly not try to, to make him, to bring him back in your clan, in your, in your, your surroundings. There must be a deep respect. It is love. I, I understand what you're saying, but there's quite a few days when I don't feel particularly loving. Uh, sometimes I... I feel as though my mind is, is in there just giving me judgment after judgment. You're not loving. You're not being in the moment. You're not 
this, you're not that. And I'm right along with it. I'm just sitting there listening to all this and judging myself. And that's where I am in, in that moment, in judging myself. And I was wondering if you could address that. How to be with my myself in those moments when I don't feel particularly loving or compassionate, even with myself, let alone anyone else. <laughs> First, you must be loving and beautiful with your nearest surroundings. That means your body, senses, and mind. The other surroundings is more, are more or less an extension. So first, you must be, have the right relation with yourself. That seems to be the hardest part, those <laughs> things that are closest to it's easy to be loving for people that are like, you know, in Africa starving. You know, people that are so needy. And it's difficult to, to have that same compassion for my family, for my parents, or myself. The first step, if we can speak of a step, is to accept yourself. Not compare yourself, accept totally yourself not a psychological acceptance, a real functional acceptance. In this acceptance, you will come to know what you are. In those moments, I know the problem. It, it flows from one moment to the other. But it's those times when I feel so separate that, that I can't even seem to remember the question. But when you once really live the understanding, there is a, a kind of recall. It comes to you. You don't need to go to it. It comes to you. But the main thing is the, the accepting. Accept the judgments and judgment, comparison, evaluation. Accepting really what you are, your capital, in other words, vital, psychological, intellectual, accepting your, your capital. And you must accept it. Then through the accepting, you become a known to it. You know it. And when you know something, you use it in the right way. You can only use it in the right way when you know it. But what is in this accepting? You may not ac ac emphasize, but you accept that there's a change of energy. You will live once in the accepting. In the really accepting, there's the freedom. The only freedom is in the accepting. The accepting is completely free of what, uh, what is accepted. In the accepting, there's a joy. And you are completely free in this when you accept it. Accept things, what happens? You're not more bound to the things. In a certain way, you know perfectly the thing, and you're not involved in it. Because the knower is never involved in the known. He's every time outside of the process. The known is in him, but he's not in the, in the known. What is it then that makes me hang on to my suffering? Like I, I mean, it's, like, it's almost like sometimes I really want it. I hang on to it. You will grow in this accepting. In other words, it is awareness.
And this knowing then becomes right acting. When there is an admirer, there is an admired. When you give yourself totally in this admiring, automatically it brings you to that, to that admirer. And there is oneness. There is not an admirer and something admired. But very often, in this bhakti state, you see the beautiful mango, but you don't beat in it. You don't know the taste. You don't taste it. I think that you, are, that you don't taste the mango is because your mind is not completely informed. The perspective of, uh, of the truth is not really clearly established. But when the mind becomes completely mature, see this new dimension, and that the mind sees its limits, then the mind gives up naturally. There comes a naturally, I don't know. In this I don't know, the mind gives up. And then you can be sure when there is admiring, automatically he will come to the fusion with the admired. But mainly uh, uh, in the spakti parts, very often you don't uh, ose, you don't uh, go in, you don't try to, 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 to taste the mango. That you must. What do you think of uh, isolating oneself from the world, such as in a mon uh, monastic life, for realizing actually? My dear friend, <laughs> the moment you believe to be somebody, you are isolated. <laughs> Hello. What is the need? <laughs> Blinded by the emotions, the intensity that we can 
When we are in the crisis, in the crisis we can, we can't act. We don't know how to deal with the crisis. So we must learn how to be related with ourselves in moments when the crisis is over. In this accepting of ourselves, there becomes more and more knowing of ourselves. And there comes automatically a distinction. It means space relation. This space relation is important. When there is really space relation, you can never come to the crisis. You can never be uh, completely involved. You will become aware of the pulsation before the crisis, but you, you are not an accomplice to the crisis, to the upcoming. No doctor and yourself can do them something when you're in a crisis. So learn how to, to deal when you are not in crisis. So you're saying that awareness develops before or after the crisis, but when you're in crisis, can you, do you have any suggestions on uh, a way to remove yourself from the you will first, You will first feel yourself that you was in crisis. Don't justify the crisis. See it what you can see. You will see that you are become aware during the crisis. And you will become aware before the crisis appears. Like certitude. As soon as a sensation comes, be aware of it. Don't try to conceptualize the sensation. Live with the sensation. Because when you face the sensation, it is a thought-free state. When you think about it, when you put it in the realm of concepts, then you nourish the crisis. You can never come out. But when you face really the perception, because the perception, what you name crisis, is a fixed energy, localized. The moment you become aware of it, there's no more an accomplice. You don't give any fuel to the upcoming, coming up. And you can be sure there is a kind of reservation of the energy. And also it points to you.
spoke before of silence and creativity coming out of the silence. And we spoke about the artist before. Um, very often, people speak about the, the sublimation of sexual energy in terms of the artist, in terms of creativity. And I was wondering, how does that figure in to this, if it does? And if so, what's the appropriate um, processing of sexual energy? Because so often, besides the joy and, and the pleasure, it seems to create a lot of reaction in terms of fear, things of that sort. It seems to be the most misplaced energy in a way. There is no sexual energy. There is only energy. When you are in love, It is inherent when you are in love to show your love. To offer. In this offering There is right distribution of the energy. But when the energy is stimulated by uh, memory, then there is wrong distribution of the energy. And there is no relation with your surroundings. There is biological survival. And what we call very often sexuality belongs more or less to biological survival. But the moment you occupy your fullness, your globality, your totality, the problem of biological survival doesn't come in in the picture. So when you live in surroundings only on the, on the level of the person or on the level of body relation, then it is only sexuality. But when there is uh, oneness with your surroundings, there is right distribution of the energy. In every moment, touching the hand, looking in the eyes, it is immediately, you don't need to go accomplish and, and act sexual. You don't need it. You, you, you can do it. You are completely free of God. But there are many ways to manifest your love. And real
simulation is only when uh, there is this oneness with your surroundings. That's transformation, that's constant simulation. People speak of the sex drive as instinctual, organic. And uh, the word drive seems to be a very uh, well-chosen word when, when one is uh, in the throes of that energy that, that may stem from memory. But uh, at that moment, uh, it is a, uh, a very com almost a compulsive obsessive drive. Um, what to do at that point when, when one is not in oneness and there is that? Most of the sexual behavior is cerebral function. Nothing else. Lust then is of the mind. Oh, yes. You mean stimulated? Yes. When you love somebody, there are so many manifestations in oneness. It is very often kind of compensation, very often, like a piece of chocolate <laughs> and so on. <laughs> so often when, when sex energy or energy that is sexu sexual because of the mind, its <coughs> memory and that, is blocked, it becomes uh, perverted and violence results or perversion of one type or another. Um, all of society seems uh, to be trying to deal with that, that problem and rather unsuccessfully. Um. But become aware of it. Take some cold brasses. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> 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 talk of the uh, of the waiting process the waiting yes uh, uh, is that a preparation that precedes this waiting time If we don't wait, we project. We project the known, memory. Life is never rep repetition. Acting is never repetition. It is constantly new. So automatically, we are brought back to wait, to wait for the unfolding. In waiting, there is no memory. In waiting, you are open to the, let us say, cosmic memory, universal memory. In this waiting, 
where what you are waiting for is completely, this energy is completely, um, find its home ground because it's not more used. It is waiting, it is objectless waiting. When there is waiting or without waiting, the waiting refers to itself. And this waiting, 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 the being openness. And this openness, once one becomes open to the openness. But really, creative living comes out of silence, observation. Seeing facts in his life, being completely convinced that the right acting comes out of the situation, and every situation brings its own solution. There is no codified solutions. Codified moral doesn't exist. Every moment is new, and you face every moment in a new way. It is very good for children, codified moral, of course. But there's a moment that the child must take himself in charge. It is more or less a crutch, no? So, a crutch, nothing else. You uh, also talk about your approach being the direct way, the direct path. What are the characteristics of this direct path as they are distinct from or similar to other paths towards God consciousness or unity consciousness? In the direct path, you face directly the ultimate. Facing direct the ultimate means here, look what is the nearest. What is the nearest? It's not your body which is the nearest. It's your consciousness. Before the body wakes up, there is consciousness. So the consciousness is the nearest. Face directly the nearest. Look at your body. Look at it. It unfolds itself. It is energy in space and time. Itself has its ultimate point and this dies, it vanishes in your consciousness. It points to your consciousness. That is the shortest way, if you can speak of way, it's even not the way. But if you try so-called ways, then you go through purifications, codified moral, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, you become suddenly a better person like other persons, maybe. You may become even a beautiful person, sure, but you remain a person. You remain constantly in the subject-object relationship. You cannot go away from it. Because what you are fundamentally, you cannot never conceive it in subject-object relationship. You are it. When you are it, there's nobody is it, and there's nothing to be. There's only beingness. But of course, in this direct path uh, from time to time, we use certain elements which belongs to the progressive way. That is true. For example, the body approach and certain things. So when you are in, in a state of duality, how do you recognize this consciousness so that you can directly be with it as the most direct and quickest way? You take note who sits there?
there's nobody who sits there. There's a mass which is sitting, but we call a body. And the body is only a name. There's a mass of weight, of heat, coolness, and so on. That, that's a fact. Look at it. And when you look at it really, you will see when there is real looking, free from all projection, free from all expectation, looking for a goal, looking for a result, real innocent looking, you will see that this innocent looking refers to itself. It takes yourself. It's like an, like an, like an, uh, an uh, a magnet. And you live it in, in the totality. You cannot think it, you cannot feel it. It is. Could you comment on the experience of spiritual transmission between the so-called teacher and the so-called student? First, I would say the teacher never takes himself as a teacher because that is a restrict as a restriction. He takes himself for nothing. And when you are established in this nothingness, you can only see nothingness. So for the so called teacher there is not a so called disciple. And it not all becomes a word play, play with words, but it becomes really real. I would say in this oneness, there is not a so-called teacher and so-called disciple. There is a living, living current of love. We cannot uh, explain it other. Otherwise, the moment you remain the disciple, you see only a teacher. And when you take yourself a teacher, you see only a disciple. So in a certain way, you maintain the disciple. That is very clear. Uh, then the many disciples go away from the guru. What is a guru? He is tragic. Yeah, gurus, their yeah, life is tragic. Much more tragic than for a man when a woman goes away. <laughs> when you are nothing, you stimulate yourself by yourself. You, don't, you didn't need any stimulation of this kind of thought. Otherwise, you you be bound to the teacher, and the teacher is bound to the disciple. It is more or less psychological survival, nothing else. Beautiful, beautiful paper and red paper and blue paper and beautiful carton and all these kind of things. <laughs> John, my question had to do with an issue that was raised here about the possible dependency between so-called student and so-called teacher. I wonder if you would comment on what it means to trust oneself. The student comes, and I've seen this in my own case, with doubts and 
feeling that I, I don't know. Your words make sense. They strike a chord deep. This real trap, this tendency to hold on to them and to doubt oneself. And I wonder if you would say something about that, what it means to trust ourselves. The so-called teacher tells you how he has been come to this experience. You must trust him. When you go when you are in the street and you look for another street, you ask somebody, where is the street? You must trust him. You may first look at him in the way how he's explaining you the street. You can be sure if, if he shows you three or four times to the left and four times to the right, and then cross three or four big places, then you must uh, doubt. <laughs> so when you come to a teacher and he, he tells you so many things to do, uh, be careful. <laughs> but uh, you must trust them. But be very alert. teacher is telling you the truth, then you'll end up coming back to yourself and trusting yourself. Yes, it's the only way. But uh, in understanding the truth uh, and that you act according to your understanding, you should uh, in a very, in a certain time, you should say, I am living more comfortable. I am more in harmony with my surroundings. And I am even more in harmony with myself. That you must certainly uh, 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 take note of it. So one must not postpone it. So in a certain way, you, you are responsible uh, what you understand. You must uh, transpose it in daily life. But uh, you must trust that, that when you are going married, you must trust the woman. And the woman must trust the man. There's a certain trust. Jusqu'au contraire. Jusqu'au contraire. Unless the opposite proves itself true. <laughs> <laughs> then you must trust the lawyer. <laughs> Forgive me. Can you? Make it a little more shorter. Yes. In, in living in the mainstream of society, yeah. working and living, what would be the one most important attitude to maintain? To be in harmonious relationship with your surroundings, you must first begin with yourself. You must have yourself a harmonious relationship with, your, with yourself. That means listen. Through listen comes understanding. 
And when there's understanding, there's right use what you understand. In a certain way, society, the world is not apart from you. You are the world. You are the society. You are your surroundings. The moment you become free from yourself, you make also, you contribute to the freedom of the world and your surroundings. So the world begins, begins with you. And you go not in this way, seeing from outside, you may certainly a good doer. But uh, there are so many professional good doers. about death and dying. Uh, you've said that our, our real nature is letting go. Therefore, death is a wonderful opportunity to go to this letting go. How do we prepare for, for dying? When we see it very near, we are dying from moment to moment. And we are born from moment to moment. But there are moments of par excellence for dying knowingly. It is when you, when you go to sleep in the evening to put uh, all your qualifications that you find yourself in a complete uh, in a complete naked state. And then when the body wakes up in the morning, before the body wakes up, you are You are presence. And when you have the opportunity to assist a dying person, then you must die with him. The moment you die with him, He is stimulated by your dying, by giving up all the qualifications. So I see I have not completely answered what, like, your question. How we do this undressing, it is so. All what appears in the moment
must be seen. Like facts. Taking note. Simply name them. There's a kind of energy which um, is eliminated or reintegrated. So you go through all what appears in the moment itself. And your attention, your love, what you bring to the perception It will come back to you. You will be find yourself in the light. In the light where is your complete nakedness. That is a natural giving up. without uh, intention. But the moment you assist somebody, you must proceed in the same way. To die, in a certain way, is something positive. Like uh, the deep sleep, and deep sleep uh, our body, senses, and mind are, are addressed. And generally we say, I slept, nothing happens. But so we misunderstand what we call by positive and negative. A deep sleep state is most positive. Because all desire to be, all desire to meditate, all desire to be what we are fundamentally comes from deep sleep. And the body wakes up in the morning, you said, I slept quite well. But um, it doesn't refer to the relaxation to the relaxed body, it refers to something more deeper. You experience in, in, in deep sleep was really the peace and, and, and joy. So I must understand what we call positive and negative in this situation. I was 
recently, or recently my uh, very close member of my family died, and I was not present. Is there any way of there being a completion when, when, when it's after the fact that you arrive? They are still residues after the person died. You can exactly do the same that you perform every day this elimination of all your qualifications. And as it was your mother, it is uh, very easy to be with her. All the, all the qualification was you had with your mother. That's very important from this absolutely naked point of view. Yes, understanding, clarification. It may be you proceed more or less through memory. I agree. But you start with memory, but you will see there's much more what you know in this relationship. Because your memory belongs only to the person, uh, the daughter. But when you take this um, naked point of view, you will discover things which annihilates completely if there has been still some, some Antagonism. Antagonism. Yes. There are many problems that uh, a friend or dies and, and you are in somewhere else and you, and you know it only many years or even many months after. Very interesting to see all the elements that you have as a person. It comes to a kind of elimination. Because what you know is more or less a conflict, a conflict. When you come more to the knowing, automatically when you, when you go away from psychological memory, then you will feel automatically explain many things uh, which dissolve the conflict. And uh, you will feel the same and oneness. It needs uh, several sessions, I agree. But still, one must proceed in this way. Can, can this eliminating process that you described um, in your contact with someone you lived with and, and they died, can this take place afterwards through dreams? In the same way you described? Absolutely. There's no difference between the waking state and the dreaming state. You can be completely awake in, in a dream state. There's no difference. When uh, when you live in psychological memory and daily life, then dreams are more or less uh, a continuation of the daily, of the vacant, vacant, uh, of the vacant state. Mm -hmm. But when you are completely open, free from the psychological memory, then dreams are not more dreams, something completely, something completely else. 
that comes out of, of uh, the universe. Otherwise, dreams are only the uh, prolongation of the, of the conflict of the waking state, nothing else. The energies of the unconscious mind reorchestrated upon realization of the self. We were talking about how dreams can have a different kind of quality. Could you elaborate on that reorchestration of the, what we normally call the unconscious mind? When you are free from the person, you are free from psychological memory. Functional memory remains, but you are completely free of the vicious cycle of past and future. So you are open to all the possibilities because you, you, you are the world. And then they act, uh, you are in, in relation with energies which when you are live in psychological memory you can never have. You come in contact with kind of archetypes that you never could have when you are living in psychological memory. But of course you must not try to interpret uh, things which appears in dream state with the faculty of the waking state. Then you, you, um, there's a kind of mutilation. So live simply with the content of the dream. I don't try to interpret it. When it comes to you, interpret it. But don't try to interpret it. But it may come to show you something, as it was in your case. Huh? I would like to speak a little more about a question that was asked before about uh, living from a deep place of trust within ourselves, trusting ourselves rather than something we hear or something we uh, pick up from a teacher, etc. that you know that you can only know yourself through you, through yourself. The so-called teacher can give you certain advice. It is more or less second-hand information, but you must make it first-hand information. That means you must go through. But important is that you must not only hear the words, which mainly are wrong, uh, pronounced and wrongly spoken. You must uh, feel the essence behind the words. So don't uh, emphasize the words. When you emphasize the words, the what is behind the words will be going in the air.
the rose that you, that you see is more what you see. The smell of the rose is something more, much more what you see of the rose, even when the rose is beautiful. So keep the smell. Forget the leaves and the rest. If I have right understand about God. Oh. But God is a concept. It's an idea. You can attribute many qualification to God, but it is it is completely a concept. The moment you, the moment you free yourself from the concept God, then there's God, only God, but not you. To have really the experience of God, you as a you must disappear, then it's God. So beautiful set the servant of Master Eckerhart. We should read it. Yes. John about, about tears when I'm feeling something deeply when something touches me tears tend to come up spontaneously or when someone recognizes something beautiful in me tears come and I wondered if that's still part of the personality or or something else. Yes. Uh, expressions also from the self, from your real self. But don't emphasize the tears. Emphasize the emotion, the beauty which is an emotion. But tears are more or less an elimination. There's some difference between really emotion and emotivity. It is more or less a reaction. But when you are stimulated by beauty, works of art, or real innocence that you find sometimes by children that uh, brings you to losing your tears at times. So is that a, a, a way that, that the heart is opening? I, I, my other question had to do with, with the heart. But oftentimes it seems when the mind is overactive, the heart's closed. And I've, I've wondered 
how to really allow the heart to open. refer immediately to the knower of the mind. The knower of the confusion of the mind. The mind who is completely uh, dispersed. immediately grow from the object to the knower. It is easy the moment that your observation is completely uh, innocent. The innocent observation refers to itself easily. It goes from an explosion to an implosion. But you must allow this implosion. You must allow this uh, introversion, let's say. It's going back. Allowing the to come up more inside? Yes. the aspect of consciousness known as the higher self, the high self, its function, and how we can improve our communication with it. when there is right observation. Right observation, free from memory, I would say is sacred. You will be taken by this sacred state of the innocent mind. And you will grow. You will grow in being. Because awareness is an extension of attention. Attention is a brain function. But when you sustain the brain function, automatically you come to the home ground even of attention, that is awareness. You will feel in one moment this expansion is switch over when you go from simply attention to really awareness.
in real tradition, one says the truth must come from the lips of the guru. And the truth which comes from the guru are that of, of reality. And it also only this truth speaking can bring to transmutation. Otherwise, it is our more or less words, beautiful words, but simply words. Where is this information coming from, your interpretation? That is not my interpretation. Do you have any idea on this phenomenon to explain it? When the truth is spoken to somebody, it is spoken in this way like an artist produces a work of art. That means in this speaking, the guru doesn't emphasize the word. The syntax, the, the law of the language. Yes. But there's something behind it. So the words are conceived in a perfect humility, simplicity, and it goes directly to the essence of the word. In a certain way, you must remember the words. But uh, in remembering it, it is very, uh, you must be careful that you remember all the, only the, the, uh, the structure, the, the, um, the language structure. So it is better not to remember it. But uh, as you not remember it, it comes back to you. When you remember some, something, only physiologically, you must try to remember it. But when you don't remember it, and, and you keep it, and you don't keep it, it remembers you. That's a different way of, of remembering. You remember it, and it remembers you. <laughs> 